think I will get started. Um, so first of all, th thank you so much for being here tonight. You could be at any other event. And so I really appreciate you um, taking the time to be here. This is our third WCS book club event to date. Um, and this quarter we chose to read the book, Donut Economics by Kate Raworth, a sustainable economic model for the 21st century. Um, so just to give a little bit background about the WCS book club, um, we started this book club in an effort to really do two things. One was to motivate other women and ourselves to read more, read more. We all have goals to read more, but it's sometimes difficult to actually do it. And so uh, we started this book club with the effort to motivate each other to uh, read more books. And as a lot of you know, in the sustainability industry, um, there's new science coming out all the time. And so it's just nice to uh, be part of a group that is, um, you know, reading one of the latest and, um, and a really also important book. Um, and then second, we wanted to create this book club as an informal space to, um, to get to know one another. Sometimes it's hard to do that in you know, formal networking events, but this is a, a laid back book club event and we hope that you guys can get to know each other um, and meet each other online and in person. Um, and so lastly, I just wanna say we, we chose this particular book, Donut Economics, because um, environmental goals are inextricably linked to, um, to economics and our economic systems. And yet there's so many of us in the sustainability field who really just don't understand economics. Um, maybe I'm speaking for myself, <laughs> but um, you know, it, it's, it's such a, um, you know, it's a difficult subject. And we thought that this would be a great book to give us uh, a macro level view of uh, economic systems and how we can create more sustainable economic models. Okay, so with that, um, can we go to the next slide? So for today's agenda, um, we'll spend the first five minutes just um, arriving and hopefully a few more people will join in person, but we'll see. Um, I'll go over some Zoom etiquette items and housekeeping items. And then for, um, from 5.40 to 6.10, we'll hear from Christina Jenk um, and we'll do an overview of the book because we really created this event for not only people who read the book, but also pe for people who didn't read the book. So um, we'll do a brief overview of the book and our speaker will give us insights. Um, you know, she is, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about Christina in just a bit, but um, she has a lot of great insights into the topics in this book. Um, then we'll go into a breakout session, um, another breakout session, and then there'll be an opportunity to um, regroup, share, ask Christina questions, and then we'll do a thank you, wrap it up. And then if we're in person, we can stay, you know, another half an hour, hour to do in-person networking as well. Great, next. So for those of you who don't know, um, Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability is a nonprofit organization that supports a network of women in the clean tech industry um, with the aim of furthering the roles of women in growing the green economy and making a positive impact on the environment. And so um, being uh, part of Women in Clean Tech is uh, great because we have um, monthly events that are in-person or virtual. And um, also we have um, our WCS Talks, which is a TED, TED Talk style conference with Google. So those are just some of the, the benefits of being part of this great organization. Uh, next slide. Um, so just a few things about Zoom, um, Zoom etiquette. If you wanna write your full name online so that um, people can you know, connect with you on LinkedIn, um, and please feel free to share your LinkedIn profile in the chat. And um, as a friendly reminder, um, please just always be respectful of each other and assume the best intentions. And um, 
uh, when you're in the breakout sessions, uh, please aim to be present and um, listening to, to one another. Okay, next. Um, if, uh, you know, for those of us who are not based in LA, you might be joining us online. And so um, WCS does offer a virtual membership that you can, um, you can join and you'll have access to all of the virtual WCS events, um, virtual happy hours, webinars, as well as to um, advance access to new job listings, et cetera. So uh, definitely um, please take advantage of the, the virtual membership. Um, next. And then just um, to highlight some upcoming events, uh, on July 27th, we'll have a uh, picture perfect summer social um, that's for the WCS SF chapter, and that'll be in person at the Bar Bottle Brewery. In August 24th, there's an executive leadership workshop, um, and that will be, I believe, online. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have the beginner pole dance workshop for a sustainable future offered by our very own um, Melise Renault. And um, that's gonna be uh, an LA chapter event and will be an in-person beginner pole dance workshop uh, where Maylise will be talking about the intersection between um, sustainability and pole dance. So those are just some of the exciting events coming up. Next. I'll, I'm gonna be the moderator for today. I'm Natalie Zant. I am um, the founder and CEO of Meter Leader. Um, we're a startup that gamifies saving energy by leveraging real-time utility data and behavior science. Um, and I've been, I'm part of the LA chapter here. And um, yeah, I just uh, love, uh, you know, meeting women in the sustainability industry and uh, getting a chance to talk about uh, really interesting ideas. And that's why I'm definitely interested in continuing this book club. And then uh, next, and so today's speaker um, is Christina Jenk. She is a PhD trained labor and development economist. She received her PhD in economics from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and was formerly an assistant professor of practice in economics at NYU Shanghai. Her research studies um, gender inequality and political economy of gender. Christina is interested in incorporating considerations for resilience, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in climate initiatives. She currently consults, teaches, and advises on projects related to transitioning fossil fuel workers to the green economy, ESG indicators, carbon footprint analytics, and equitable deployment of green infrastructure. Thank you so much for, uh, we're so lucky to have Christina here and, and we really appreciate her being here today. So with that, I will hand it over to Christina. Hi everyone, um, I'm Christina. I just wanted to check to see that everyone can hear me okay. Yep. I can hear you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, great. Uh, thank you, Natalie, for the kind introduction. I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, I put some of my information uh, in the chat. Um, feel free to email me or connect on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm going to do a very difficult task of trying to summarize some of the main ideas from this um, pretty complex book by Kate Raworth. Uh, she goes through a lot of territory. What I will do is summarize some of the main points through these um, excellent diagrams provided in the book and also provide some of my personal insights and stories uh, from the world of uh, microeconomics. I'm an applied labor and development economist, and my journey has been focused on issues of inequality, poverty, and development through this discussion. Um, okay, so for those who have never read this book, or for those who have read this book, um, I, th I think we can all agree that we can at least review the seven main concepts of the book. Um, the first one is here, change the goal. 
The other six, I'll just read them right now. Be the big picture, nurture human nature, get savvy with systems, design to distribute, create to regenerate, and be agnostic about growth. So the first, the first chapter of the book talks about changing the goal of what economies are about. Um, it talks about how the history behind to be. Most countries measure GDP. It's a measure of um, the value of goods and services produced in the economy. And this book is trying to introduce a new way of thinking about the goal of economies. And this new idea is uh, the title of the book, the idea of a donut economics. Why is this idea particularly interesting for me? When I started entering the world of sustainability and clean tech, there was a lot of jargon and vocabulary being thrown about uh, the words resilience and sustainability. And for me, trained as an economist, we're particularly focused on being very precise, whether it's with our math or with our words or with our models, I always felt a little confused about what people meant by sustainability. What I think is useful about uh, this, this book and this chapter is that it visualizes an idea of what sustainability look like, looks like. The main idea is that the point of economies is to produce goods and services such that uh, humanity remains in the donut, which is above the inner ring and within the outer ring. The inner ring is something you can think of as a social foundation. Look at the inner ring. This includes energy, networks, housing, social equity, political violence, education, income, and work. The word infrastructure comes to my mind. I thought a lot about the concept of infrastructure, and I think it it's beyond just physical transportation like roads. I think infrastructure includes these social foundations, housing, social capital, access to healthcare. And so the way that I interpret this inner ring is, well, the purpose of an economy and a society is to deliver some basic infrastructure for their society. Then there's the outer ring, the ecological ceiling. So this is the place where society should not move beyond. Whatever we, whatever our, our activities and create, uh, we should not move beyond these um, planetary boundaries as Kate Raworth calls it. And this ecological ceiling includes um, many environmental and, and natural boundaries. It involves land, um, freshwater withdrawals, um, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, chemical pollution, air pollution, climate change, ozone layer depletion. Um, I think also this donut has some pretty, has a pretty interesting resonance for me because I was a faculty member living in China uh, I was living in Shanghai, and I got to see for myself different ways in which communities and cities were living inside the donut or outside the donut or within the donut. So um, just a few comments chapter, change the goal. The author is saying 20th century economics lost its desire to articulate its goals. And in its absence, the economic nest was hijacked by what she calls the cuckoo goal of GDP growth. Um, and I really like this, this illustration of how a cuckoo can actually hijack the resources of the other birds uh, when it's being grown. And she's arguing that GDP growth other valuable activities. I also do want to say that officially economics is the study of how society manages its scarce resources. And that is a definition I can get behind. The problem with a lot of the economics I learned and the profession that I'm in um, is that 
it doesn't actually recognize very important scarce resources such as uh, non-renewable fuels, um, other kinds of natural resources, and something I'm particularly interested in, which is uh, unpaid care time of women. So that's one comment I have about the economics profession is that it often overlooks scarce resources, certain kinds of scarce resources in its models. A few more comments about this first chapter. Why is society of P growth? I wanna put forth a hypothesis. I do think that GDP growth is actually correlated with shareholder profits. And in the US and in many other countries, um, it is the duty of many companies to maximize shareholder profits. The problem is that shareholder profits and GDP growth are not necessarily distributed in an equal way among society. Um, another is that so civil society and government needs to start accurately measuring the costs of growth, the costs of GDP growth as a starting point for accountability. There's a lot of talk about the intellectual history of economics throughout these seven chapters. And one thing I will say, as someone who was a physics major in college and then did an economics PhD, I will say models and then the models I learned in the economics program, which were actually imported from physics, are very beautiful. They're beautiful to work with. But I personally think that there is a danger in violence that comes from this beauty because when we start thinking that this beauty actually um, is reflected in the real world and imposing those kinds of mechanisms on a world that does not follow that kind of system, um, a lot of destruction um, can come about. Um, I do want to say that in the current pandemic, we've seen unprecedented economic conditions that have completely flabbergasted traditional economists. And I think it actually speaks to the importance of the ideas in this book. We are in a current state where there's lower growth, yet there is a tight employment. And usually those two don't go together. Um, but it speaks to some of the issues of unsustainability that Kate Raworth talks about. Um, another thing I wanna say is that um, in terms of changing the goal, Kate Raworth talks about really beautiful ideas such as um, human welfare as a goal, um, if, um, the idea of small is beautiful, a centering ethics um, and human scale, I just wanted to say these ideas are beautiful, but they do not they're not necessarily consistent with the outsized financial returns that venture capital and many investors look for. And that can explain why there's a shortfall in capital markets funding for important initiatives. And so overall, as the rest of the ideas, and then already I'm seeing I'm running out of time, I am wanting to put forth the idea that to make Kate Rawler's ideas more real, I don't think she emphasizes this enough. I think we need to shift our ideas about what finance is for. What is finance? What is the purpose of finance? And how should it be done? Um, the other thing that I think Kate Raworth um, kind of skips aside, but I may want to, I think I want to discuss a little bit more is in terms of the inner ring, the delivery of infrastructure, she kind of punts on the very important details of how should the infrastructure be organized and delivered? What is the, what is the governance or what I call the political economy that can deliver this infrastructure? It's not just about money, it's about the organization of local and federal and state government delivering these basic amenities. And that's actually a very important question and a lot of political scientists have worked on this. Anyway, so if we go to the next slide, um, she, this is a characterization of where we might be right now. Um, so for certain people, um, 
there is a shortfall in terms of basic infrastructure. In developing countries or in poor communities, there may be a lack of jobs, maybe a lack of peace and justice in education. Um, I experienced it myself when I was doing um, field work in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and saw a shortfall of so much um, infrastructure, both the physical and the human infrastructure. Um, meanwhile, um, parts of the earth and well, globally, there is climate change and parts of the earth are suffering from biodiversity loss, um, land conversion um, and uh, nitrogen phosphorus loading. So that's, that's just an example or visualization of the unsustainability of what the global economy, what a national economy can deliver. Next slide, please. Um, the, the next chapter is about seeing the big picture. It's about actually looking away from the picture that economics paints. Um, first of all, there, it's a picture of this enclosed circular economy where um, two inputs, workers who provide labor, and then capital assets, which may include land, um, produce wages and profit for an economy. And it moves and circulates among households and businesses. Um, and then this money is um, provided by banks, regulated by the government, and moves across borders through trade. And there are many elegant ways that have been developed to describe the economy. And the author is saying, we actually need to not think about the economy in this way. There are actually a lot of missing actors. We need to think of ourselves as part of an embedded economy where the economy is actually first embedded within society. Um, and I, I want to put forth actually a society that has its own social and cultural norms. And then that society is embedded within the greater earth. The economy itself needs to be and the ecological boundaries. And of course, what powers the economy well, it first starts with the sun, solar energy, converts it to other energy, and then there's different kinds of waste, including heat. So I think it's, it's a useful um, diagram. The important thing to note about this particular chapter is I really like Kate Raworth's way of describing what she calls the neoliberal agenda, the old way of thinking about the market, and then painting a picture of a new vision of the embedded economy. She thinks of it as a play. Um, so she describes the neoliberal agenda as being, the market is efficient, so give it free reign. You assume business is innovative, so let it lead. Finance is infallible, so trust in its ways. Trade is win-win, so open your borders. The state is in common, don't let it meddle. So that's the original story. And she points out that in the story, there are some missing characters. The household is missing, especially the work of women. Um, the commons, um, they're tragic. They're not there. What happens to them? Are they to be privatized or they should be collectively governed? There's no society here and there's an inexhaustible earth. Um, and power is irrelevant, irrelevant power. In the embedded economy, there's a different set of characters with different sets of assumptions. First, there's the earth, and you assume the earth is life-giving, so you respect its boundaries. Another character is society, which is foundational, so you have to nurture its connections. This links to the ideas of social capital that she talks about. There is the economy, which is diverse, so support all of its systems. Um, and the household, which is very core, and one must value the contribution. I will say that actually in microeconomics, there is a discipline just focused on the economics of the household, which I was more interested in. Um, but in the economics of the household, it did leave out the important unpaid work of caregiving, usually uh, done by women. And in the embedded economy is, powerful, so you embed it wisely within society and ecological boundaries. And she talks a lot about the commons, and she talks a lot about the commons are creative, they need to be managed well, and their potential needs to be unleashed. So when she thinks about the commons, she thinks about common creativity, 
creativity and distributed intelligence. She also talks about how the state should play, the state is essential, so it should be accountable. She talks about how the state should be an economic partner, which would actually mean a very different relationship between the public and the state. Um, and as an aside, I did live in an authoritarian country with a different kind of governance model. And it is true that in that particular country, it was an economic partner for many cities. It did come with freedoms for sure. Um, but I did see a different kind of model. Lastly, the character of finance. Instead of society serving big finance, which often seems like the case in the US political economy, finance should actually serve society. Um, and then I will also pose the question now and maybe in the later breakouts, what would finance to serve society rather than the other way around? She also says the character of business, um, business is actually innovative, so it needs to be given purpose. Um, she talks about how power is always at play between workers, shareholders, and owners of businesses because of the inequalities between them. And business needs a purpose that's far more inspiring than merely maximizing shareholder value. Trade, she says it's double-edged and so it should be fair. One thing I do wanna add is there's a growing amount of literature in economics showing which, who are the losers from globalization, specifically from trade. And as an example, um, just as an easy example, because it's a large trading partner, there is, for example, a paper showing that opening up to imports from China directly leads to rising unemployment, lower participation, and reduced wages in the U.S. Um, so it's not that it's not only that globalization can make prices cheaper, but they actually have direct effects on the labor markets of the importing country. And then another character, she says, power is pervasive, so check its abuse. Um, oh, there was a slide I forgot to include, but there's something called the elephant curve. So if you Google it, like economist elephant curve, you'll probably see um, a figure showing that between 1980 to 2016, um, the top 1% captured 27% of total growth in the world. Um, sorry, let me say it's just for the US and Western Europe. So this is just the high income countries. And then the bottom 50% of total growth. What you see is that the hump, the middle, experienced the least growth from all this globalization. And so that's called the elephant curve. And that relates to some of the points that she's making about inequality and trade throughout the chapters. Um, okay, next slide, nurture human nature. So going forward, uh, she makes some really, I think kind of radical um, suggestions. First of all, we shouldn't think of ourselves as rational economic men or women and should think of ourselves as social adaptable humans. Now, all of us, I think, already sort of do in certain, certain ways, but I think when we think of ourselves in the business world, in the professional realm, um, we want to think of a rational economic person. And she's pointing out the, um, the ways in which playing this game in this way becomes unsustainable. Um, she goes through a nice intellectual history of where rational economic man comes from, and then goes into a description of a new identity. And I like this quote that she um, points out. The portrait we paint of ourselves is who we become. That is why it is essential for economics to portray humankind and you. Um, and she's advocating for several things. Rather than thinking of ourselves as narrowly self-interested, we should think of ourselves 
as being social and reciprocating. And that ties into some of the principles um, in chapter six and seven. So for example, in chapter six, that companies and organizations should be focused on regeneration by design. Um, so that's actually an example of this uh, principle of being social and reciprocating rather than narrowly self-interested. In place of fixed preferences, we have fluid values. I mean, we like to think of ourselves as being consistent with each other, but a lot of behavioral and psychological research has shown that our values and our opinions are actually context dependent. Um, she wants us to think of ourselves as uh, interdependent rather than isolated. We should remember that rather than calculating exactly, we usually approximate. And far from having dominion over nature, we are embedded in the web of life which relates back to her ideas in chapter two of us being in the embedded economy. Next slide. Happy with systems. This is more about um, reviewing these ideas of general equilibrium that were developed by economists. One very famous application of general equilibrium is the meeting of supply and demand. So on the left-hand side, these are the famous scissors of supply and demand. And equilibrium is the point where supply and demand meet. So this is Econ 101, where many, many students learn about how markets should work. Um, but she points out that the conditions under which this works are actually really specific and unrealistic. It requires that no one has any market power. Everyone is what is called a price taker. So everyone is, no one is big enough to influence prices because everyone is small. And then there are these assumptions about um, diminishing returns, diminishing marginal utilities. These are sort of mathematical assumptions to make the equilibrium very nice. Um, and she's saying that the actual economy is more about dynamic complexity and it's a dynamic complexity that is not easily modeled. If it's a completely unordered, unordered complexity, it can be modeled using something brought in from physics, such as statistical mechanics. But the way the economy works is it's not completely unordered. It is complex, but it's unordered. And the tools of physics are not fit for modeling this kind of dynamic complexity. Uh, the idea of complexity, I think, is particularly important when, and, and also how um, unsuitable the idea of general equilibrium is, I think it's really important when thinking about the Great Recession that most of us lived through. Um, and she writes that due to equilibrium thinking, economists were paying scant attention to the banking sector and in those model at all, which is completely untrue. Um, a lot of regulators were working on the assumption that networks serve to disperse risk. And so the regulations they de devised only monitored the nodes in the network, but they weren't keeping track of the interconnections. Next slide. Um, she wants us to think about distributing, being distributed by design. So in many ways, distributing technology, power, knowledge, networks. Um, the, the chart on the left is something called the Kuznets curve, which is a correlation showing that richer companies, um, they start with low inequality, they go high up in inequality as they get richer, and then they um, decrease in inequality as they get even richer. It's just a correlation, but a lot of economists thought that it was a good story. Next slide. Um, there, on the left is something called the environmental Kuznets curve, just a correlation, but a lot of people said it might be a, ca a causal story where as economies get richer, they will naturally clean themselves up. And she gives a lot of evidence to show that this is not the case. Um, she instead says, we shouldn't think about, we shouldn't just assume that economies will clean up after themselves. And I think a lot of us can see that that's not the case. Rather, we should think about economies being regenerative by design, where we take in biological and technical nutrients and 
do and participate in two parallel cycles. One is to regenerate and capture value at each stage of decomposition. And the other is to participate in activities of restoring, repairing, reusing, refurbishing, and recycling. Next slide. Um, and I, the, the last chapter is agnostic about growth. And I think this is a pretty, almost a revolutionary idea. It's not pro-growth and it's not anti-growth. There are many folks out there who talk about being anti-growth, but being agnostic about growth is, 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 is not being not growth and it's not being pro-growth. She talks about how most of the models and the uh, institutions that are structured assume growth addicted. And she's saying we should be growth agnostic. And she uses this nice, um, I see a, a comment, it's not revolutionary in Europe or Japan. So thank you for that. <laughs> I think it's revolutionary for the American mindset and the American story, perhaps. Um, now, growth agnostic, I think, I think she uses a really nice um, analogy of a plane taking off. We're growth addicted. It's a plane taking off and never landing. And she says, it's time for us. And another analogy that I think doesn't come from the book from elsewhere is we should be thinking about ourselves as being in helicopters. Helicopters are not designed to need some runway. They can also stay, stay still. Perhaps our economy needs to learn how to stay still like a helicopter. So these are actually pretty revolutionary thoughts uh, relative to standard economic narratives. And so I have a couple more minutes. Uh, and I'll, I'll spend the last couple of minutes um, with a few overall comments. Um, the question that I've been asked and I've been asked myself, I've been asking myself is, what does it take to fix the design failures that the author talks about? And I think this is an important question. I read some book reviews of this book and there were some comments that some of the ideas and new initiatives that she talks about are unrealistic um, or she glosses over important issues of something called political economy. And I think I would agree with some of the sort of the criticisms. I really respect the vision that she's charted. I think her storytelling is great. I think it's worth reading um, her, her um, charts and diagrams and reading about the inspiring examples. But one thing I do wanna point out is that for us to be regenerated by design and to fix things and to fix these design failures, it actually does require a new sense of yourself, new stories, new myths, almost new religions, new ways of thinking about the goals of your own life, the goals of your um, And so I just wanna end with saying, um, it may seem overwhelming, but I think um, similar to the visual of the distributed network that was shown on a previous slide, the best way to get there is to start with yourself and your local network and your activities. So I'm hoping that in the breakout sessions, we can talk more about the ideas and how we can each um, help our society move towards a more sustainable economy, such as in donut economics. So that's it for me. Thank you, Christina. That was um, a great overview of the book. So I hope for everyone who wasn't able to read it, you um, get a sense of what the book is all about. And now we're gonna go into breakout sessions where hopefully we can talk in a little bit more details about, um, about elements of the book. And we also have some questions to um, inspire some thought or conversation. I hope uh, you guys enjoyed those breakout sessions. Um, and now is an opportunity for us to a, ask any questions that you might have for Christina or just share some of the insights. Um, if there was anything in particular that you wanna share from your group discussion. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna kind of open the floor and I guess I would just ask if you can raise your hand over Zoom, like the raise hand function, 
or if you're in person, just raise your hand. Um, so I don't know if I can see everyone. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone can see if uh, anyone has raised their hand. I can't really see it. No one is raising their hand, oh. but um, maybe if you'd like to start off by something that was, you know, powerful in your breakout room. Yeah. yeah. So I think a question that we had that we wanted to ask Christina actually was, um, you know, there's so many concepts that are talked about in this book and changes that can be made at like the individual, the corporate level, the local level, the financial level. Where, Christina, do you see uh, the highest like leverage point to take action on first? Um, I think it depends on where you're located, um, like economically, socially, and politically, because um, we're all in different places and we all have we all have leverage and power in our own ways. And um, I, I really like the graphic of like, a, like this idea of distributed networks. Um, and so I like the idea of companies and organizations being built up at a local level. You can do it on your own, in your own way, whatever you're doing. Um, but also working on the complex interconnections between all the different organizations and nodes in a way that can communicate together and uh, align with each other in terms of values. Um, so similar to that um, example of the Great Recession, where the regulators only focused on the banks and didn't think about the interconnections, I think what we need to do is whatever you're doing in your sphere, um, also remain connected to folks working locally in their own areas too, and see if there can be sort of a a sense of collective identity and purpose. Yeah, and on a on a macro level, is there? I know you mentioned finance. I would just love to hear your opinion. Like, um, on a macro level, where do you think there's leverage, like opportunity? So, um, actually, finance is is looking for returns. I mean, there's too much liquidity. There has been a like a lot of liquidity in the global markets in general, um, even with the rising interest rates um, that the US is signaling and has been hiking. Um, there's just a lot of liquidity and not enough um, good, productive founders and ideas. Um, I'm seeing venture capital um, just fight over um, like the good ideas. What it means is that um, I think that Founders and workers have a different kind of bargaining power at the negotiation table now because there is a relative supply of workers and good ideas to be implemented in good teams. Um, so I think that's an opportunity to renegotiate um, financial contracts between investors and founders. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of into ESG. The problem with ESG is that it's easy to greenwash um, and I think the opportunity now or the way forward is better measurement reporting and verification or better metrics on important outcomes. It could be, you know, carbon emissions, GHG emissions, but really um, holding companies, products, organizations accountable, particularly their scope three supply chains on a large scale. It does feel overwhelming, more political support for um, holding companies and other institutions accountable after the West Virginia versus EPA ruling, the Supreme Court ruling that gutted a lot of the power of the EPA. Now it's up to state governments and local governments to really try to take action. So I think there are more people at the local level taking more responsibilities. So I think that is encouraging. And when techs at the local level are gearing up, I think that also changes the mindset of finance too. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I guess on a similar note, I'll just share one thing that stood out to me in the book related to the, what you just said that maybe I, I was thinking could be a point of leverage is um, they mentioned like the four day work week and um, 
I just notice myself in my own personal life when I have more time, I can become more active. I can, I'm more active in my community. I'm more active politically. I can be more active politically. Um, so I would, that's just a thought that came to my mind that if we could all have a little bit more time, maybe we could put our efforts towards um, some of these efforts as well. Um, Hey, anyone else want to share anything they talked about in their group or any questions you have for Christina? I, I don't know how to raise my hand while I'm sharing screen, so I'm just going to jump in. This is Oakley. Um, I, we talked about what is prosperity and what does prosperity look like in a sustainable world? Um, and Christina, you mentioned care. Can you elaborate on why prosperity is really centered around care? I think it should be centered around. I'm not sure if like the U.S. current economic system is built that way, um, but I think I think it should be. Um, as a labor economist, a lot of what we study is something called human capital, and we think of human capital as um, health related to health and education. And so there is a way of measuring the economy in terms of the levels of health and education people have. Um, also, freedom from violence and access to justice are um, commonly ignored or not really regarded in the field, though that is changing. Um, I think that if you start looking at the economy and measuring the economy that way, access to care becomes very important. Um, and so, um, that, so that goes back to chapter one, change the goal. Change how we measure our economy. Um, the re I personally think that GDP is often reported because it benefits a small group of wealthy people. They benefit from GDP growth, but it doesn't necessarily benefit a large chunk of other people. Now, what if there were headlines based on human capital, like healthcare, education, and access to justice? Um, so I think of access to justice as a form of care too. And um, yeah, so that I think that we should start imagining a society that is that is prosperous through access to care and justice. Um, oh, was somebody going to ask a question? Uh, this is Simona. Um, yeah, I was reading someplace that in, in some countries I have started using a, um, I think they call it the gross welfare index um, as a, uh, as another way to, me to measure prosperity than the GDP. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Christina, if you've heard about this or um, if you know anything about it. Oh, yeah, I'd like to learn more. I know that there are happiness indexes. Um, I know that several politicians have um, in the U.S. have proposed measuring um, economic welfare in different ways. I'm o I'm open to a, lo a lot of them if they can get closer to you know true human flourishing. Do I think there's one right way to measure? Probably, but I'll go. I'll cite Kate Raworth's principle of we can approximate. We don't have to calculate exactly, but we can approximate. Um, and there are certain indicators that are better at approximating a lot of different things all at once. In fact, I think I just saw an article today that said that the you could summarize most ESG metrics, or oh, it's arguing you can summarize most ESG metrics through carbon emissions, because carbon emissions is actually correlated with a lot of other social and economic mm -hmm. too. Now, I'm not sure if I believe that, but I like the idea of trying to like distill all these ESG metrics into something much simpler. Um, Christina, if, if uh, I guess I'm just speaking for myself as somebody who wants to learn more about economics and finance, do you have any recommendations for any books where we can get started? Um, not necessarily textbooks, but you know, I love that this book was so accessible. Um, to somebody who, again, is not super familiar. Um, so I, I didn't know if you had any other recommend, book recommendations. Uh, 
Um, there's different areas of finance that um, that pe different people might be interested in. So like there might be like personal finance, like just finances. And there's definitely a gender difference in knowledge and confidence about investing and managing your own personal finances. Uh, the research has shown that. Um, I like the work of um, Suze Orman. Um, she's, she's good. Um, and there's a lot of good personal finance podcasts targeted towards women that I've seen out there. And then I think they're probably like apps and robo, uh, robo advisors targeted towards women too. Um, so yeah, I think learning kind of start you on this journey in terms of raising capital for your own venture. Um, unfortunately there still is a lot of like old boys club, um, things going on. Um, but there are actually more and more female focused investor networks that I've seen. I saw that through my work with the feminist nonprofit. Um, so they're out there. Um, so see if you can join the networks. I, I learned of this, um, group, uh, the book club and the group through climate journey. Um, I really like my climate journey as a clean tech ecosystem. Um, yeah, noticing that unsurprisingly it's very male dominated. But it's also a great place to network. There are a lot of folks who are willing to help and to teach. Um, and so I think um, going to joining one of these ecosystems and um, asking questions is helpful. It can be a bit intimidating. Um, so I would suggest where folks who work within venture capital or different stages of finance, like where women who are interested in nurturing the community can come and speak um, about certain topics. Um, and I also want to say finance is changing to think there's more of an, there's much more of an em uh, emphasis and interest in ESG. Um, and so I, I think that area is interesting too and exciting. Um, but in terms of resources, oh, there's so many. Um, I just mentioned personal finance, but um, I, I'm an economist, not a finance person. So I, I'd have to do a little research before I recommend. Yeah, sounds good. All right, everyone, we are at that time where we are going to be sort of finishing up the virtual component of this. Yes. Um, so uh, I hope you guys uh, found this interesting and uh, valuable. If you're interested in continuing to participate in the WCS Book Club, we have a Slack channel you can join. And we do have our next book selected, which is um, Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. This is a book that focuses on what is the worst possible outcome of climate change. And I know that sounds maybe a little morbid, but I think it's always good to know the worst so that you can really work <laughs> toward not being there, not getting there. Um, so that, uh, We'll have another book club event on November 3rd. So I uh, hope to see you all there. Um, and then uh, just to reiterate, we have our upcoming events, which I mentioned at the beginning. And um, you can also um, you know, sign up for our newsletter and, and, and you know, learn about these events that are upcoming. And, um, and I think you can go to the next slide. And then again, just a big thank you to um, everyone who's participating in this event, especially our speaker, um, we're all volunteers and um, I really appreciate everyone um, taking time to be here and um, organize this event. Thank you, everyone. This was such a great event and I can't wait till November 3rd. Yes, mm -hmm. likewise. And um, yeah, thank you again, Christina. Um, so I think with that, uh, and then of course, follow us on, you know, all the social media uh, channels. Um, and uh, I think Christina, if you might be sticking around a couple minutes, if, if there are any like last questions people have for you, but otherwise, um, thanks again for coming online. And uh, next time, maybe see more people in person. That'd be great too. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you so bye. much. Thank you, Christina. Christina, I had a quick. Thank you.
a quick follow-up because um, you were talking about like simplifying the ESG metrics and it kind of had me thinking that at the start of donut economics, it talks about how we came up with GDP and how we almost wanted like the president in the 1930s wanted this simple metric and it was just this easy metric to use. And so I guess, do you think there's any harm or any risk in, in trying to simplify it to one metric, we might get into another situation like we had with GDP where there is, it looks like there's correlation, but uh, in, you know, later on down the line, we find out that that's not true. Yeah, so I think that is always going to be, um, that's always going to be the case for metrics or indices that companies or different organizations use for their KPIs or their uh, OKRs, objectives, key results, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, there's a danger in looking at one and then not looking at context. Um, I've heard of some suggestions that could be helpful, which is look at three different KPIs, no more than three, but focus on three, which is just to limit the number. And another one, which actually takes more skill and more work and more care, which is to supplement the metrics with um, qualitative information, like listen to people, take interviews. <laughs> and we can listen to people. We have amazing um, natural language machine learning algorithms that can interpret people's speech and writing. So we just need to have the will to listen to people, I think. And we can quantify it now. We have we have so many tools with our algorithms um, now. Um, so if we had the sort of the will and the capital to listen to people and give feed, for them to give feedback, we would. Um, so I, I like that. Um, and in terms of, yeah, I also like simple metrics because you need to be able to frame it within a story that's understandable for everyone to be able to understand, not just the elite. So I, I like that too. Definitely. Um, any last questions for our speaker? Otherwise we might start eating our veggies over mm -hmm. here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank, you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it, Christina. Thank you all. Uh, you feel know. free to email me or connect on LinkedIn. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Christina. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.